Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Black Health and Wealth Show. I am your host, Kevin Boyette, and I am honored today to have my friend, Prince Dykes, the author of Wesley Learns to Invest, the CEO of Royal Investment Financial Group, and he's going to talk to us today about what folks need to know before they invest in the stock market. A lot of folks are wanting to get into the stock market now because they're hearing in the news that the stock market is high and that it's been doing really well over the last year or two. And Prince is going to give us just some, some tips on what you want to do before you want to jump out there and get into that market. So uh, Prince, I want to welcome you and thank you for you know imparting your knowledge on us today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here today. Uh, one of the things like you, you hit on earlier, which you said that um, now, now that people see the media, they see the news, they say, wow, the market is hot. The market is high. Maybe this is the time I should get in. So it's been people that have been following me, you know, for years that uh, said, OK, they finally see the returns coming around and then they want to jump in. And actually, and I, in my honest opinion, I think it's the time we should be leaving because you have to understand the market moves in uh, four cycles. You got the uh, four business cycles. You got the trough, which I felt was like in 2008. They went, we went through an expansion period, which we're kind of still in, around about 2009, 2010. You probably remember in 2008 when unemployment was high, gas prices was high, uh, we was in two wars, all type of stuff, right? Oil prices was high, everything, right? So what happens next is that you start to see stimulus, the same thing you see going on in, uh, going over in England, when you start to see interest rates be lower, you start to see jobs be created, bailouts, all those things are part of the stimulus package. Also, even pump, they even pumped money into the stock market because they wanted to build back investors' confidence because a lot of investors had lost confidence into the market. And when investors lose confidence into the market, guess what? Corporations can't make money because when we buy stock, we're pretty much giving our money to a corporation. And if corporations can't make money, they can't, if they can't depend on Wall Street to be that big bank from the public, then, you know, that slows down them being able to hire people, expand, build new products, all of the stuff like that. So when investors didn't feel confident, because what do people do when they see the market going down? They don't buy. They sell. Everybody's selling. Hedge funds are, are unloading. Banks are unloading. Everybody's unloading. That's what pushes the market down. So one of the, uh, the, uh, the Federal Reserve said, hey, you know, we need to pump money into the stock market to build back uh, investors confidence so when you put money into the stock market you start to pump it up people see people buy more and more when they see it going up in the asset world people buy more when they see it going up but in the goods and the liability world when people see prices going up they buy less for a prime example if you went in and saw a box of cereal uh frosted flakes going for fifty dollars you'd be like what are you crazy i'm not buying that but in the asset world people would buy it if it was a, a house and things like that because in the asset world, like, you know, stocks, real estate, any type of asset, when people going up, they, when they see things going up, they think it's going to go higher. Nobody thinks about the downside. But when people see things going lower, they think it's going to go lower. So um, putting that back into perspective is around in 2008, a lot of investors had lost a lot of confidence in the market, as usual. Same thing you've seen in every market crash. The one we had in 2000 with the dot-com bomb, going all the way back to the Great Depression, everything. People sell because they get scared of the market. They move their money to more secure things like gold and cash and commodities, silvers and stuff like that. So you probably remember back in 2008 when everybody was saying, hey, we buy gold. Let us buy your gold, your metals, because people move more to what they consider to be a safer asset or a safer investment vehicle at that time. Once the stimulus packages came in, once they started to put money into the market, once they started to bail out all these companies, things started to look a little bit better. The market started to go up people start to come back into the market. That's what creates the expansion phase, the second phase. First, 2008, I felt it was a trough. Around 2009, 2010, I think we went into an expansion phase. Now you started to see everything reverse. Remember in 2008, you saw gas prices, oil prices high. Now you see gas prices, oil prices low. In 2008, you saw high unemployment numbers. Now in 2010, 2011 area, even to today, you see low unemployment numbers. Now if you don't be fooled by the unemployment numbers because some people don't, um, some people just stop looking for work and some people are underemployed. So, right. you know, that's where you can get, don't be fooled by the unemployment numbers. Say, oh, we're, we're living in a great economy. Let me pat myself on the back. 
So when you start to see people come back to the market around 2009, 2010, as we went into the expansion phase. Now, as we kept, continue to grow into the expansion phase, next, after the expansion, is a peak. So next, you got to say, okay, where is this peak at? You know, this peak is when you start to see market at an all-time high. Um, the stocks have done this, S&P 500, NASDAQ. You know, this is the best market we have ever seen. And I know we just went through an expansion. That's when it starts to go off in your head. Ding, ding, ding. Maybe there's a peak where maybe we're at the peak or we're very close to the peak. Because, look, everything just went into reverse. 2008, gold was high. Oil was high. Now in 2016, Oil is low, gold is low, silver is low, the commodities are low, markets are high. So what happens next? Then after you have your peak, you have a what they call a recession or you have a contraction, what is considered to be two quarters of a declining PDG, GDP, you know, <laughs> close to Mr. Product. Right. And when you go down to next, you're going to go into your trough phase again. So knowing that those are the four cycles of business, on the four cycles of the market, you can go all the way back to when the market started and see those same exact cycles come again. And they usually jump about every eight years. You know, in election season, historically in election season, you always have a bull market going into the election. So it's no surprise right now to uh, any investor that we see a bull running and going into the election. Now you have to be, you know, it's not about being with the crowd. You can run with the crowd short term, but if you're going long term, you have to uh, – plan and strategize to go with what is next to be in front of the crowd. So right now, yes, you're going to see people pump up the market and you have to understand that people buy stuff off of the news. I've had, uh, as long as I've been uh, out on social media and around and about, uh, I've probably gotten more inquiries with coming into the market now in 2016 than I have ever had in the last four or five years of me starting when I went public. Uh, and that is because that, you know, back when I was saying, hey, this is the time, hey, buy this, buy that, people were like, oh, okay, well, I keep an eye on it. And now they've seen it triple, double, quadruple in, in uh, value. Now they say, wow, you know what, you're right. You know what, I, I, I want to do this now. And I'm like, well, I think that boat may have sailed. And I don't want to push people into going into something that is, uh, that could be potentially at its peak because that's when people buy more. You know, for a prime example, let's look at even let's do the same thing with real estate. In real estate market, if somebody makes a hundred thousand dollars, if somebody buys a house for a hundred thousand, then they sell it for two hundred thousand. The next person buys it for two hundred, they sell it for three hundred. The next person buy it for whatever the case may be, they'll continue to do that because they uh they think it's gonna continue to go up. So when they see something going up, they they buy more. That's why we always in the asset world have bubbles. Start market, start market bubbles, you have uh, real estate bubbles, you have any type of bubble you could think of. Gold has a bubble, yeah. anything. So that's what I, I tell people, like, hey, you know, you have to keep an eye on interest rates because right now, uh, look at the things that they did. When you look at everything's uh, reversed with the Federal Reserve, you know, back in 2008, they lowered interest rates. You know, it's a typical one-on-one -on -one play of trying to stimulate your economy. Same thing you see done in England. Now in 2016, they're talking about raising interest rates. Hey, do we think the economy is stable enough to pump into interest rates? So now you have to look at it in reverse and say, okay, wow, I see them doing the exact same opposite that they did about eight years ago. So these are the things that you can be looking at uh, coming to a shift. Now you have a lot of, you know, people out there that says, hey, you know, we have a lot of, which is true. Um where interest rates are not having as much of an effect on the economy. Uh, we have a dollar that is uh, pretty much, you know, it's a, it's a currency. You know, it's a, you know, we lost the gold standard to where we can just print money at any time. We have uh, a lot of people, over half of Americans are underemployed. Then outside of being underemployed, they also have, uh, by them being underemployed, they also, you know, the average household is carrying more debt than has ever carried before. So you look at you you're looking at the economy. You're saying, okay, well, where are these good numbers coming from? Where are all these uh, investors are coming from? Where are these you know market is coming from? So people have their reasons to believe, hey, maybe this is just pumped up and uh, the economy is not as strong as it needs to be. Because the first thing is, if the economy is very strong, then Jane Yellen wouldn't have a problem, which is chairman of the Federal Reserve. She wouldn't have a problem with raising interest rates, you know. But they're holding off on interest rates. They did like 0.25 just a couple of months ago. But the interest, rate, interest rates are pretty much low and are pretty much almost non-existent. So 
you know, so you, you look at things and, you know, around the election, I think we're going to see a big shift in the economy. You know, going into election, and historically, if you look at every election season, there's always a bull going into the market. But as we turn that corner, I think that we could see a, uh, and it's nothing wrong with like, oh, it's going to be horrible. It's just a cycle. It's just a cycle of, hey, you had your expansion. Now you're going to need your peak, and what goes up must come down. The same thing we saw in real estate. Right, but my question to you is, if it goes down this time, mm -hmm. um, is it going to be, in your opinion, worse than 2008? Because 2008 was bad for a lot of people. You had, a lot, especially for black people, they lost a lot of wealth um, mm -hmm. at, during that that period because you know they were targeted with the subprime loans and with the credit mm -hmm. cards and those kinds of things. So now, um, for those who have made some of it back, do you think that this next downturn will be even worse? Um, the next downturn, the next downturn, do I think it'll be even worse? It. Depends. I think um, who's in office will have a huge factor on this election, um, not because of the one person, but I just feel as though the team that they will bring with them and the way they will approach the economy. Uh, you know, I'm not a very political and outspoken person, but I just know some people's opinions of the market and things like that. Uh, do I think it of being worse? I slightly worse. Slightly worse than what we had in 2008. Do I see, you know, the market bottom them out to where, hey, I can't believe this happened. I don't see it going as crazy. I just see a natural drop, a natural fall off of 2008 coming um, with the subprime mortgage. You know, we, we're kind of seeing the same system that we had before that got us into this situation in 2008. It's kind of playing itself again, you know. Right. Where... Um, you know, we learn our lesson. We make it a little bit better. I know that the Federal Reserves and people have put in a lot of, uh, they put in many, um, what, what you want to call it? I want to say rules and regulations. And they put in a lot of uh, tests to say, hey, let's make sure, you know, I know for I know for example, at the biggest banks on Wall Street, they have to go through stress tests. Uh, they simulated 2008 with them to say, hey, because the thing about the subprime mortgage would, what, uh, what got so ugly about it was that people didn't know how bad it had gotten. You know, when, for a prime example, nobody kept an eye out and said, whoa, Goldman Sachs has this, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, all the biggest banks on Wall Street, AIG, they all have this. Look at the bank in England, all of the banks across the world, they are loaded up on subprime mortgages. Nobody connected all the dots. Everybody was kind of doing their own thing. Hey, I have some, you have some, we have some. Cool, fine, and dandy. So now the system is set to play to say, okay, who has what? And what if this thing went bad? Everybody is loaded up on these subprime um, mortgages, uh, CDOs or CD, you know, collateral, collateralized debt obligations and uh, credit default swaps and stuff like that. Everybody is loaded up on this stuff. Let's, let's see if it went bad. Let's see how many people are holding this stuff. So now they have a system in place to see how many people are – loaded up on one thing or play in one way, you know, because, you know, before it's like, it was like the wild, wild west. Hey, you know, you got Nike, let's say, put it in a, in a simple term, let's say, you know, some of the biggest people in the world, we all have a billion dollars in Nike, but nobody knows that we all have Nike. We all kind of, you know, Goldman Sachs is over here doing this, this person's doing this, doing that. And next thing you know, you don't know that, hey, you know what, if you pile this all together, most of you guys have your money tied up in this, this right, subprime right. mortgage. You know, well, people didn't connect the dots. You know, you had the the lender selling it to the bank, bank selling it to this guy's on Wall Street. The Wall Street guy throwing it inside your four hundred one k, throwing it inside this person's four hundred one k, throwing it inside this person's uh, retirement. They're managing this company's money. They're throwing it in there. They didn't tie it all together and say, you know what? We're really dependent on if this mortgage that this person shouldn't have. Who's, you know, this person who makes $100,000 a year is living in a million-dollar house. When this balloon, you know, yeah, he can pay for the first three years, but when this balloon comes or this big variable mortgage, this arm mortgage comes around the third or fourth year, and he has to pay the whole thing plus interest, you know, kaboom. Nobody's looking right. at that. The whole well, system I mean, I, was good as long as the person could pay their mortgage. Well, I know you talked about the stress test, and I know Deutsche Bank just recently failed theirs. Yes. And Bank of Italy failed theirs. But mm – -hmm. 
getting back to what folks need to know before they get in, I mean, and they should definitely know this type of information, mm -hmm. but for a newbie that's just thinking about taking their money and investing it in the stock market, what kinds of things should they do? Is there classes they should take? Are there books that they should read? Are there, you know, one of they the, okay. buy a Wall Street Journal subscription? I would say one of the first thing you do with me at this time, if I was coming out, I was new into the market, I wouldn't purchase a stock that wasn't paying me a dividend. That was just me. I wouldn't purchase because, you know, when you buy a stock that doesn't pay a dividend, uh, it's usually you can only make money one way is if you if it goes up, you know, unless you want to get into advanced trading. So if you're a beginner, you're probably not. You are going into a market to where, hey, I only can make money if it goes high, knowing that a potential bear, you know, could be around the corner, you know, meaning the market's going down. How can you make money when the market's down? You can just hold that stock. But if you got a, a stock that has a historical, you know, dividends aren't guaranteed, but if they have a historical trend value of they pay dividends, then, hey, I can let, you know, if the market does take a hit, I can at least say, hey, you know, I can uh, at least collect dividend, you know, royalties off of my uh, stock and let that be reinvested and I can buy it at a lower price. Uh, that would be the first thing. The, the second thing I would do is I would look and say, what's my risk level to say, hey, what I want to do? You know, do I want to be somebody that's trying to pick individual stocks or do I just want to be somebody that buys the whole, uh, buys the market in general to say, hey, you know, what? I'm going to get an ETF that tracks the S&P 500 or whatnot and continue to invest my money there and not try to pick individual stocks. So if I was to come into the market right now, I would be looking for stocks that are paying me uh, dividends. And, you know, I would look at, you know, that would be the first sign. Do you want to get a little bit advanced and go into the P.E. ratio? Uh, number one thing you got to do is educate yourself, right? Um, now we are living on the Internet where you have a plethora of information to where you have a plethora of uh, inboxes to you have groups, you have channels, you have podcasts, you have all so many sources right now. You can pull out your phone, download three or four or five apps. It's so much information that you have right now just coming in to the market that you could be uh, invested in. Uh, one of the uh, books that I like right now is uh, Tony Robbins, you know, Seven Ways to Master Your Money. I definitely like that one. Uh, I would pick up that book so you could learn a lot on that to come into the market. And it's, it's a good information on indexes and mutual funds and ETFs and asset allocation all that good stuff. So that would be one book, but it's a big, thick book. If you don't like reading a book, you could just download the audio book and just listen to it or whatever, whenever you can. And it's all about your circle. You know, if you, uh, like uh, one of the guys I just, not just interviewed, but I interviewed a little while ago, I put up on my channel with Bill Walsh said, if you, it's something you heard a lot anyway, uh, if you hang around four broke people, you'll be the fifth one, you know, and uh, get around, get around in that circle of people who are actually doing it. And be careful to, you know, it's like anything, you know, it's like a religion or a church or anything else. You know, you got to be careful who you eat from. You know, you sit back and you watch them, look for their history, look for their credentials, look for their track record and make your own decision, you know, to say, hey, this is somebody I want to get in and follow. But the first four questions you must ask yourself before you purchase anything or even seek any type of advice, see a financial plan, anybody, you have to ask yourself, Hey, do I want to be short term or long term? Anything up under twelve months is considered short term. Anything over twelve over twelve months is considered long term. You got to ask yourself, hey, I'm just doing something for three months, six months, or hey, I'm looking long term. This is for my kid, or this is I'm looking ten years down the line. You know, I'm not looking for a quick return. I I can go into this long term. So make that decision. Am I short term or long term? Second thing you must decide is your risk level. Do you want to be very risky? Do you want to not be risky. Hey, I want to play this conservatively. I want to play aggressively. You know, most people are going to ask you, they're going to look at it by your age and say, hey, you're young, be aggressive. But you have to make that decision and say, hey, listen, I have $100, $200, $500, $5,000, whatever the case may be, and I just want to go crazy. I want to go short-term and aggressive. You have to make that decision. Then once you make that decision to say, hey, I want to be short-term and aggressive, now you can look for particular industry or stocks to say, hey, these are things that could yield me a high return in a short amount of time now but your risk level you understand that hey if it you know if it can grow fast and it possibly can lose fast as well now on the flip side of the house you may say uh, hey i want to be long-term and conservative 
then you can go into you going into a whole another branch of investment vehicles. So first, first thing you got to do is ask yourself, what are your goals first? I want to be short term, long term. Um, read the books, surround yourself with the right people. So is now a great time to be doing that because this market is high and um, there may be a downturn coming soon. So is now a good time to start doing that studying and becoming that student that you're talking about? Yeah, definitely. I think right now is, um, you know, I really, I think at any time is a great time to come along and um, get into those circles and meet those people and uh, watch those YouTube videos, listen to those podcasts. If you find somebody or something coming in close and near to your city, check them out. Check out the webinars. Invest into yourself. You know, that's all that stuff is investing into yourself. You know, you can sit down and uh, you got webinars you can go to from your house. You got people you can, a podcast you can listen to from your house. YouTube videos you can watch from your house. Facebook pages, you can just, articles you can just get coming to your Facebook, you know, while you're sitting at home. Or your Instagram, or anything like that, and or your email, or your email, or yeah. you know, you can get email. Then all you could just, hey, guess what? A webinar is going. I'm gonna check it out. Hey, somebody's coming to my city. It's a workshop. It's a course. Let me go check that out as well. So those things are investing into yourself and knowing, hey, where are we at right now in the market? Should I be coming in? Should I lose? And when you educate yourself, you can plan before the market crash. You know, so you can plan before the market crash or you can be saying you could say, hey, I just want to ride this wave going into the election season. So you could, uh, you know, benefit from both ways. Right. Now, there are people out here that are saying that on September 27th, they're predicting when the next downturn will come. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that? I've, I've heard that I think it was September 27th or 30th, one of those uh, with the currencies that we can see, you know, uh, the dollar take a significant hit. But to think about, let's say, for example, one of the things on Wall Street, the firm that makes the most money on Wall Street, believe it or not, is the firm that brings in information. You know, the, the firm, you know, the, the firms pay the most money to who can bring them information first. So for a prime example, let's say you have a firm like a Bloomberg. Bloomberg is huge because they can get you the information first and fast. And that's what firms want. In the beginning, I want the information first and fast. So when a news article come out, you got to think about it. How many people already know this? Right. You know, how many people are reading this exact same article? You know, they're going through the same media outlets. They're getting the exact same articles and everybody's known it. Because for prime example, let's say if an earnings report come out, a bankruptcy, anything crazy come with the company, that has to go through a process to get put out to the public. You know, if somebody went and go and buy a block of stock, a block is 10000 or higher. That has a process it has to go through. It has hands it has to go through. So when, when somebody sees that come across their desk, they have a list of the first five people they're going to contact. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is going on. This is going on. This is going on. People pay to be the first one on the list. This is what's coming down the pipe. You know, position yourself. So the thing about it is you have to position yourself to say, hey, listen, um, how many people have seen this exact same information? How many people are playing this exact same information? And sometimes people push down the market just off of news. Right. Just off of just off of an article. Somebody could just put out an article, a flavorless article of uh, Netflix did something. And people just sell the stock just off of the news, just off of an article. People will buy stock just off of the news, just off of an article. But you have to be wary when you see information. You got to ask yourself, everybody sees the exact same thing. And any, you know, any seasoned investor would know, okay, they're probably going to play the opposite. And everybody knows the market is not that easy. It's not that forgiving. Because if it's that easy and forgiving, then nobody will be working. Or nobody will be, uh, everybody will be doing it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if an article comes out and says, hey, the market's going to crash tomorrow morning. And everybody knows that. And everybody knows on September 27th, September 30th, this date is going down. The market is going to be a huge downturn and you could make a huge profit. You know, every investor in the world is, you know, licking their chops for this day. In order for a trade to be successful, or in order for something to be successful, there has to be people on both sides. Right. In order for there to be a winner, somebody has to be a loser. So are we going to just say, hey, that um, Wall Street is just that dumb that they don't, they haven't seen this article and they don't know and that, you know, we're going to take all of their money come 
the end of the month. Well, um, it could it be that they're that not that they're that dumb, but because nobody was prosecuted or sent to jail or you know, only thing the big banks had to do is pay fines. I mean, you had Lehman Brothers that went down, but mm -hmm. they had to pay fines and they got taxpayer bailout money, but they've gone back and basically done the same thing again. Yeah, and the biggest thing was the reason how they got on that because you, you got to think about it. You know, it's a difference between a broker and a fiduciary. A broker is, you know, they're, they're series six, series seven people. They are a broker. They're there to broker the deal. You know, they're not there to act within the best interest of their client. And that's why, uh, you know, people that pass the series 65 exam, they're a fiduciary. They have to act within the best interest of their client. So, for example, you take a firm like a, a Goldman Sachs, uh, the reason why they got into hot water because they sat down. If you haven't seen the movie The Big Short, oh, but, uh, many, many times a great movie. Anybody you want to wonder about what we're talking about, watch The Big Short. Now, the Big Short, the, the guy, the real guy's name is um, John Palsy, right? You know, John Palsy walked into, they didn't have his name in the movie because he still works on Wall Street. He still has his firm, still catches the subway. And that's a beautiful part about Wall Street. Nobody knows these people. These people catch subways, eat out of hot dog stands. Nobody knows or cares. You know, it's no sign that says Goldman Sachs right here or this firm is right. You know, nobody really cares. But long story short is um, you take the movie like the big short when the guy went into the firm and he said, hey, um, I want to be able to bet against this, the housing market. There's no, there's no way I can do that right now. So hey, let's create an instrument that I'm going to uh, pile together the worst, you know, um, some of the most toxic mortgages, and I'm just going to put it out there to sell. And so Goldman's job was to create this instrument and to sell it. You know, find sophisticated investors to leverage Eastside. This guy was saying, hey, I have this money. I'm willing to bet against it. So they said, okay, well, it'll work as long as we can buy somebody that would bet for it. So they went out and they found people to buy. And at that time, everybody thought, hey, real estate, it got the grade A stamp from um, Standard & Poor because when I learned in Wall Street, it's a conflict of interest. You go, you take your bond, you take your instrument, you take it to go get monitored, uh, not monitored, but graded by uh, Standard & Poor, and you're the person that's paying them. So... You're paying them. Great. They're paying the yeah. You're paying the person, and all people saw was real estate mortgages. Oh, good stuff. You know, real estate it never goes down. It's good stuff. They stamped it. You know, they put a grade A on it. And the amount of people are thinking like, oh, people not even paying attention. They're just buying grade A bonds. Mm -hmm. So now when they have this happen, uh, in that case, you know, um, Goldman Sachs. Yeah, they knew that it was built to fail, but that wasn't their interest. They was a broker. They were there to broker the deal. So all they had to do was they called their clients. They didn't tell their clients who made this and it was built to fail. Their job was to sell it and people brought it all up. They wasn't the only ones, but they're the ones that caught the most flack for it. And But the reason how they was able to get off because they say, hey, we're a series six and series seven people. We're here to broker the deal. It was like, did you warn your clients that this was going on and that it was a conflict of interest? That's not our job. Right, we're not right. supposed to. And they were right. It wasn't their job to, for example, you can go on E-Trade, a Scott Trade, TD Ameritrade, TD Ameritrade, Trade King. You can buy whatever the heck you want to buy. They're not going to stop you and say, hey, Mr. Boyd, we think that you shouldn't buy this because this is going on. They're not going to do that. Their job is there mm -hmm. to broker the deal. That's it. That's what Goldman Sachs play in the whole situation was we're here to broker the deal. These are so we didn't sell these to regular people. We sold this to sophisticated investors that ended up in regular people's 401k. They was like, hey, if they wanted to buy it, that's on them. We were here to broker the deal. That's why nobody got prosecuted. That's but that's when President Obama he wanted all of Wall Street to fall into the fiduciary standard. And that's why they gave him pushback. And the reason why they got pushed back because that's just not the way Wall Street do business because a lot of people will lose money. So that's when President Obama said, hey, why don't everybody follow the fiduciary standard? Because that's how Goldman was able and any other broker that was involved in that situation was able to walk away. That was not our job to warn our clients that this instrument was built to fail. We just made it available to them. We called them. They said they wanted it. We gave it to them. They got paid. They weren't saying anything when they was collecting uh, all, the, all the money from the CDSs. When it's collecting right. the money every month, they, nobody said anything. It only became an issue when it failed and people found out that 
Goldman helped put this thing together. They know it was built to fail, and they know that these their clients was you know, but that wasn't it's Goldman's job. Their money was at risk. Yeah, yeah, they, they, that wasn't you know technically on paper by laws of the SEC that wasn't their job to you know that's like me buying a bad instrument and saying E Trade didn't tell me that this thing was built to E Trade. That's not their job. Their job is to tell you what it is and to make it available for you. You buy at your own risk, and that's what that's how they was able to walk away. Now, we, we you talked about, and I got to go back a little bit. You mentioned something um, for for the newbies. You mentioned about ETFs. Can you just define what an ETF is? I mean, they're not going to know necessarily what an ETF. Okay. Is. Oh, no. um, ETFs like the new hot kid on the block. You know, lately, you know, people are moving out of mutual funds and they're going into ETFs. Um, an ETF is pretty much, you know, well, what do the ETFs stand for? Exchange traded fund. Okay. You know, yeah. Exchange traded fund. And uh, what that happens is it's just that you can buy and trade it like a stock. And it's pretty much like a, almost like a mutual fund. It's like a basket. You, you have your thing, pretty much it just tracks stuff. You know, for a prime example, let's say if I like, hey, I don't know what stock I want. I don't know anything about the stock market. I can't pick a stock. I just want to get the S&P 500. And you go get a mutual fund that gets the S&P 500. Now, with that mutual fund, S&P 500, you have managers that are actively managing that fund. They're actively managing it, meaning they're moving pieces around. They're moving pieces around to match the S&P 500 to get the same returns. So since you have somebody that's actively managing those funds, the fees are usually a little bit higher than, you know, it would be on an ETF. What an ETF does is it just, it's a passive way of investing. It just tracks something. It just goes with it, whether it is gold whether it is uh, the S&P 500, whether it's uh, Dow Jones, whether it's the industry, whether it's the uh, being bearish on the dollar, bullish on the dollar, it just tracks. And it's just like, hey, since it just tracks like this, it doesn't care. It's not trying to uh, go in and actively manage and beat and nothing like that. Since it's just a passive investment, the fees are usually a little bit lower. I'll use a whole lot lower than it will be for a mutual fund that is actively managed. So that's why they're kind of hot now because, you know, uh, they're like, hey, I can passively track something and uh, I get lower fees. People are more attracted to that. So that's a pretty, and think about it, trades back and forth like a stock. You could, uh, let's say for example, gold. You're like, hey, I don't have a lot of money. I want to, you know, I want to buy a, uh, a ETF that tracks gold. And then you have to read that particular ETF. Every ETF has its own way of tracking gold. But let's say if it tracks, it tracks gold. If gold goes down, it's going down too. It's not going to try to match, and it's not actually managed. Gold goes up, it's going to go up with it. Well, well you, you know me and the precious metals. I'm a firm believer in holding on to them and not and not doing the ETF thing, especially after you had uh, Deutsche Bank last week or a week before, where uh, folks went in to to collect on their gold that mm -hmm. they had in their ETFs, and there was no gold to be collected. So they defaulted on on, on the on the gold. So yeah, some banks, a lot of them, they don't even have the gold themselves. Yeah, yeah, they don't, they don't even have the gold. So I'm like, if you if you're gonna get gold, get it or silver or any precious metal, get it, and you know, find your own way of, of storing it and keeping it uh, safe, and not depend on one of these banks to do it for you. Exactly. You know, the only the big thing that people like about ETFs right now is that it's cheaper. Let's say if I only have a hundred bucks, they say I can't afford any. You know, or they don't want to go through the process, you know, a.k.a., you know, we live in a microwave society, you know, who can give it to me the quickest, fastest and the quickest way. That's what they jump up and do. So mm -hmm. that's why, uh, you know, people love, uh, you know, some people may be more attracted to an ETF. And then also it's on a market that, you know, you look at the volume of it. I can easily sell it, you know, I, you know, right. in most cases, hey, I can just tra I can trade it like a stock. I can say, oh, wow. I have a gold ETF is trading at this today. I can go technically go and sell it. What I have to sit back and worry about, you know, oh, let me do this. Let me, you know, let me find somebody who's willing to buy it. You know, let me do this, whatever. So it has its, its pros and its cons. Yeah. You know, it, versus, it, I think you're going to have more, more of those places popping up, like you said before, that are, you know, we'll, we'll buy your gold, we'll buy your, your, your silver, mm -hmm. we'll buy your precious metals. I think we'll have more of those places popping up soon. <laughs> yep. <laughs> We see those same thing that, you know, because people, it's just a, a fear when people lose faith in them. And it's just any sell-off. All it takes is about 
one hedge fund to sell off stock and start the and to start the domino effect. Right. One hedge fund, you're talking about moving millions of dollars outside of your uh, ETF. I mean, you were talking about moving millions of dollars out of the market. The market is going to definitely, uh, you know, the market is definitely going to uh, retract. Right. You start to head down. So that's one of the things that I tell people as well is that, you know, um, if the market start to head down, then all it takes is another hedge fund and this person and this person. And you can have a uh, the market downturn start just that fast and quick. You know, it doesn't so, take a whole so lot. This, if this market downturn comes mm -hmm. about, I, w I really want to say when um, mm -hmm. this market downturn comes about. Should these people that we're talking about today that are maybe new to getting into the market, is that the time that they should jump in once things kind of bottom out? I think um, where they buy low and then they can, if they, you know, want to sell high or, you know, they can do that then. Yes. It's a, it would take the mentality you have when you go into the store and bring it to the market. You, you wouldn't dare. If I told you, Hey, you know, it's a box of frosted flakes for $50. You wouldn't go in and buy everything. You'd be like, man, these people are crazy. You know, what are these, a gold frosting flakes or something? I'm, I'm not buying that. But if I was going in and tell you, like, hey, look, they got boxes of frosting flakes for 40 cents, you will probably buy up a bunch, call your friends, call your pals, load up because you see value because you know what this user trades at or how much is usually, you know, use this box, I guess, in four or five bucks or whatever. But you're like, man, it's 40 cents, man, this is a steal. Same thing in 2008. You know, to a a, a, a uh, training investor, you know, 2008 was a lot of things was on sale versus a beginner. And back then I was a beginner. You know, I thought it was the end of the world. Oh, man, you know, man, we're in two wars. We got a new president. We got oil prices high, gas price. You know, these companies are failing. Wall Street, is, right. these banks are closing. This is the end of the world. <laughs> Armageddon, like, man, you know, get ready. You know, you better get you some beans and bullets. That's all that's going to matter now. And that's what I thought because I had that time. I was in the beginner phase mm -hmm. to where, you know, but I was around some seasonal people that said, hey, this is the best opportunity. I'm like, man, these people are crazy. They don't see what's going on. I don't know much about it, but I'm, I watch the news and they're saying that, you know, all these big firms, they've been around a hundred years, you know, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns are just gone now. Man, this is crazy. This is not coming back or whatever. So um, that's why, you know, it's just like, would you, it's that same mentality, but to an experienced investor, they will go in and they will buy everything, just like you would do in a grocery store. Somebody went in there and said, hey, look, these toilet papers, you know, 10 cent a roll. Like, what? This is from pretty nice toilet paper. 10 cent? You'll probably load up on it. And that's the mentality that uh, I think that people should have. You know, that's why women make the best investors, because women will bargain shop. They know what the prices are. Uh, women know, you know, they, they, they bargain shop. They know what good prices are. And they know when, when to buy them. They know, oh, at the beginning of the month, that's when prices go up. And at the end of the month, that's when they go down. In the middle of the month, that's when they're pretty decent. And it's the same thing with the market. You know, when you see an opportunity or you see things go on clearance, yeah, you should buy it up. Okay. So are there, is, are there any stocks that you see that may be going that that clearance rack? Um, that will be going to the clearance rack. I think yeah, they may go to the clearance rack. Yeah, I think that a, a stock. I've seen a, a couple that I think are overgassed, and um, I think we got to use another secret weapon. Now, I'm trying to do some um, inventory right now of like Nike and uh, Under Armour. You know, I know Under Armour has all not Under Armour, but Nike has always been that good old boy stock and always done good things. But this is why uh, kids will tell you what the future is. And that was a subliminal message in my book, you know, Wesley Learns to Invest, when he picked out all the, you know, he picked out a company, he picked his favorite things because kids will tell you what's going to be popular in the future. And the thing now is, like, what are kids wearing? Are they wearing more Under Armour or Nike? Which brand do they care more for, Under Armour or Nike? You know, which shoes do they desire more, Under Armour or Nike? Because if the young kids are getting into Under Armour, they're only going to grow older and older and older. And then that's what I can see the possibility of Under Armour becoming a force to be reckoning with in the future, you know, you know, because a lot, you know, a lot of things that become popular don't become popular because they are, uh, they don't become popular because the old people are buying it. They become popular because young people buy them and make them pop. It's like, why does Batman and Ninja Turtles and Superman can still go into movie theaters and do great numbers? Because it's just the people that grew up on that stuff just got older. 
You just got more money now. Like, why does Michael Jordan shoes, you know, are doing so awesome? When I was in high school, that was the shoe to have. It's just the difference now is that these same people are now in the middle class. <laughs> they got more money to be able to buy what the stuff they like, and they're going to keep the brand going. So that's one that's one stock I like to you know pay attention to is Nike versus Under Armour to see which one is, you know, I know what I like, but I have to pay attention to what the next generation or younger people, what are they wearing more of and what they care more about because they're going to carry that brand into the future. So I don't want to be the guy like, yeah, when I was growing up, Nike was the thing. And now these people are on Under Armour. As they get older and your your generation is getting older and phasing out, Under Armour is going to become a force to be reckoned with. So uh, that's one company that I would keep an eye on. Uh, another one is, you know, of course, you got uh, the commodity market out there. The, uh, the you know, um, the silver and the gold, things like that. You got all type of mining companies for gold and silver that are dirt cheap penny stocks right now that could potentially see a large upside. Uh, you have another... Um, you have companies out there like a Ford, you know, good old Ford has been around for God knows how long, but everybody's in love with Tesla right now. I think Tesla is going to see some problems big time major. Mm-hmm. As far as I can see, it's been a company that I never really understood why it's trading for that much money, you know, right. and, it just, and people buy it off of news. It's completely news and gas. It's my opinion. Right. It's no hard numbers that are there that says, hmm, this is something that's to have. This, right. I ain't seen that for years. I'm like, and I always compare Tesla and Ford. I'm like, why do people look over Ford? You know, you got to be careful of companies that are babies. And what I mean by you're a baby is, you know, like, for example, if you look at me and my son, he's five years old now. If you were to wind the clock back five years ago, you'll see who, who grew the most. He grew the most. He went from being a side of a football to – you know, a little person. Right. You know, with me, I'm kind of the same size, right? So it's the same thing in business. But when people see that growth, they think like, whoa, you are expanding. You're going to take over. And it's just, you're a baby. <laughs> you know, Ford has already matured. It's already done it's all these things or whatever. And versus Tesla, it's the new hot kid on the block. And it's just, oh, look, we're in China. Ford has been in China for how many years? And it's just that new kid, the same thing with Netflix, the new kids and stuff like that that people go crazy about. So I think that Ford is a good stock that uh, I think is a good old conservative stock that pays a nice dividend that could go, you know, do some great things in the future. All it takes is these whole, oh, Tesla, it has this new battery and it's got an electrical car. All it takes is for Ford to make an electrical car. Right. All it takes is for... Like everybody's been talking about the Google car, everybody's been talking about the Apple car. But ask yourself this question: Where have you ever seen a Google car, or where have you ever seen a Google or an Apple car manufacturing factory? You've never seen it, and that's that. You know, I don't know any place that. Oh, this is Apple's car manufacturing building that they're building. This is uh, Google's car manufacturing. So that means they don't plan on mass producing their cars. In my opinion. And I think that it will go to a company like a GM or a Ford or one of those companies to make their cars for them, or possibly a Tesla to make their cars for them. So I think that they may turn around to a good – I mean, Ford is going to go into the electrical car market. It's, it's, it's a known. Right. It's inevitable. It's inevitable that, you know, you're not going to sit here and make gas with a car. It's just you're going to evolve. The same with General Motors. And when these big boys start to generally evolve, to start to evolve, or would Tesla be in that conversation? Mm-hmm. That's where, you know, I think that, you know, these companies are going for $12 right now to lunch money. They're going for lunch money right now, and they're paying nice dividends, and people don't talk about them. They have great numbers. You pull up their numbers, you compare them to Tesla, I don't see where is that. It's just, you know, Tesla come out, we're going to take people to the moon, people buy the stock. <laughs> now, hey, no. now, when you talk about um, how you were studying Under Armour versus Nike, or just like you mentioned, Tesla versus Ford versus GM um, or Toyota or something like that. Where are you studying these things? Is it in the newspaper? Is it online? Is it specific places that people can go? Well, if, um, you, have a, if you have any type of brokerage account out there, you could... Any, you know, these are publicly traded companies. When you are a publicly traded company, that means you have numbers that anybody could get. 
right? So for prime example, if you don't even have a brokerage account or anything, you could just Google. I mean, you can download the app Bloomberg, you can download Market Watch, you can download CNN Money, all that good stuff like that. But one of the things you can do, you can go to Google and just type in Ford Annual Earnings Report, and it will pull it up. Just read it. You could okay. go to Tesla and say, "Hey, Tesla's annual earning report," and read it. Let's see. Let's look at the revenue. Let's look at the bottom lines. Let's look at. Uh, let's look at the profits. Let's look at the revenue. Let's look at the expenses. And you know, if you get inside of their 10Q or their what's the other one for the annual 10Q or whatever, you, you're getting the raw, raw, raw reports that these companies are sending to the SEC. Mm -hmm. You know, if you get their 10Q or their 10 kilo, that's what it is, a 10 kilo or the 10 Q, that's the annual reports that they're sending to the SEC. You're not getting all this glossy stuff. It's a 10 Q and a 10 K, right. 10 Q and 10 K. You're not getting all the glossy, which is you know, the, the other firms, they'll just pull out what's important, what people can read or whatever. So if you pull out that 10 kilo or that 10 Q, you can sit back and say, compare the two. Read them down and compare it to say, hey, you know, look at, okay, Tesla's going for $200, $300. Let's look at what their profit is. Zero, hmm, is they made no profit, but why are they trading this high? Okay, let's look at the profit of Ford. Oh, $1.4 billion. Wow, they made $1.4 billion last year. This company made anything. Why is this, that lets me know that a company is overtraded. Right. You can look at little things as you know, price earnings, price earning ratios, uh, betas, all that stuff like that, and just look at the the natural novel investor that comes onto the market. You know, people buy what they think is going to be the next big thing without nobody reads the black and white. Everybody just goes off of what hey, what I heard, an article came across, and you got to think about it. Those companies are paying for those articles to be ran. That's part of their PR. Right. Or this fax came into the office off mm -hmm. of our fax machine unexpectedly saying buy these stocks. But exactly. Right. People pay for that stuff. You know, Tesla will go out and say they put on those big events. That's they pay for all the media media. Those are well planned. Those are events. And every time people see it, they oh whoa, boom, let's go buy this. Or boom, that's all that stuff is there is a PR. So people are buying PR packages and saying, Ooh, this is the best company in the world. Let well, me see. The other question, like you were saying, is, you know, just if you're out driving, how many Teslas do you actually see on the road? Yeah, people don't see that. They All they do is they watch the unveiling and they say, oh, wow, oh, oh, I'm going to grab this, you know. And then when they see something crawl, come across one of their news outlets that says Tesla scene, and their PR people are paying for that. Their PR people are saying, hey, run this ad that say we've seen an upsell, which is, has to be, you know, Hoping is true. They say, hey, say we've seen a 10% growth. People don't even read the lines and say, okay, what does this mean? They're like, oh, the, the, they they just tested a lab rat and it went to the moon successfully. Bye. Well, this, this is a monkey and the monkey made it to the moon. So they're going to start doing trips to the moon. Boom, buy it. Right? And they're right. not looking at, okay, they're buying a $300 stock in a bull market with a zero PE ratio. It has zero profits or nothing like that. Just and on then, just on media media attention. Yeah, media attention. You know, that's what and that's why those uh that's how CNN make their money, that's how the people make their money, you know. You're a company, you want people to get to buy your stock. You you have a PR package that puts you in the media, that puts you on Kramer, you know, money talks and puts you on all these places to bring attention to your company. And people sit back and watch that and they say, Oh, wow, let me get this. Hey, guess what I heard? I, I got a little bird that said this, not knowing that everybody has gotten that same letter. You know, right. Everybody, you know, everybody, you know, so now would you would you recommend folks look at like pharmaceuticals or Pharmaceutical. science and mm -hmm. technology or you know? That would go into their risk level. If they have a risk level of, hey, I have a very high risk level, I don't mind taking the risk. If that's the question, I would yeah, you can look at some pharmaceuticals that are like Either you're going to strike out or you're going to hit a home run. All mm -hmm. it is overnight. All they got to do is just get one thing approved by the FDA, and they put a, they run a PR package on that, and it's boom. That company's going to go up. Hey, the FDA approved this, or they approved that, or whatever. And if they get something past the FDA, a, a pharmaceutical company could just jump. Now, if you're more of a conservative investor, because you got to think about it. Now, how are you going to pick out of all the millions and millions and millions of pharmaceutical companies? Now, 
you could be someone that could, you know, I know people that go back and they just buy a couple of them that they feel that are very dirt cheap, a couple penny stocks, and they just sit on them forever. And then that's a beautiful part about stocks. You can just buy it and just sit on it forever. And like, hey, if this thing ever goes crazy, good for me. If right. it doesn't. I, I put out a hundred bucks on a penny stock. Mm -hmm. and it, it's blown up now. Now, can you define what a penny stock is? Penny stocks are, you know, companies that are traded on the um, pink slip or the OTC market. Uh, they're usually up under a dollar. The thing to be careful about those is you got to watch the volume on them. You have to watch the pump and dump on them. And what I mean by pump and dump is just like I said about the PR firm. Let's say, for example, I take Royal Financial Investment Group public. Now it's public. It may come onto the market. It, it may hit, you know, let's say if it goes for 10 cents. So now it's going for 10 cents. How do I get people to know that my company is on the market? How do I get people to know that, hey, this is, a, you know, I'm here now. People can invest into me. What I'm going to do, go on my Facebook page? No, you're probably going to um, go out and do a, a press run. You're going to find people that are going to talk about your stock. You're going to find people to go and uh, write about your stock, you know, whether it's YouTubers, whether it is, uh, let me see, YouTubers to um, social media people to actual TV to anybody that has any type of influence. Social media marketing people, whatever. Exactly. They're going to reach out to them and say, hey, talk about this company, talk about this stock, talk about this, whatever the case may be you know, just to bring attention to it. Then people are like, oh, it's only 10 cents. I heard about that company. Yeah, let's give it a try. And that's how they get the, the activity. Then some people pump and dump mentality where they get out there and run mass, mass uh, media. They say they may, they may take $100,000 and buy this stock. And then it was spend another $10,000 on just media. Just this is the stock to have. Black Wealth and Health uh, Show, you got to have this. This is this new company. It's doing this. It's doing that. It's doing that. It's doing that. It's all this other great stuff. So people will say, hey, you know, it's only 10 cents. Let me buy it. And then by people naturally buying it, now it may go from 10 cents to 80 cents. And guess what? I'm out. Now I'm going to dump my portion. I walk away with, hey, I just I walked in with $100,000. Now I walk away with $600,000. I'm out. Good luck to all those people that just purchased it. No, I was going to pump and dump with my show. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just, <laughs> I'll just, say, I'll just say you know, but you got to be weary of those things that people. Royal investment was the long term play. Over <laughs> <laughs> dump. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's a bad stop, but people can get behind it and say, "Hmm, I can take this company, make it seem." Uh, for prime example, um, a company I remember, classic example. I was involved with one about three, four years ago. The stock was called D-O-M-K, right? They were supposedly making um, batteries for iPhones, like solar panel batteries for iPhone. Like you just, you just put the case on your phone and you use solar power and it charges up your phone automatically with the sunlight. And, you know, everybody was like, this is the stock to have. It came across from desk like, hey, man, you know, guys like, man, I brought this stock at 10 cent. You know, now it's at, a dollar now, you should, you know, blah, blah. And I looked at it and I was like, man, that's kind of crazy that this type of technology is out, but nobody's talking about it. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy me some. You know, I haven't heard about it. Maybe they're going to do an unveiling. And I brought it in. It got up to about $2 and some change. And I was like, you know what? I'm not about to be greedy. Everybody was like, wait till the unveiling. It's going to do this. It's going to do that. All the other news came out. I just left. I just got out. You know, I took my coins and I left. Mm -hmm. And people stayed around, no, man, it's going to get bigger. and bigger. You know, I would just say today that stock is at zero. I've never seen the product hit the street, come out, anything. Any company that gets attached to a big company will always go up. You know, big company go down, little company goes up. That's just merger acquisitions that happen all the time. You know, uh, I make a collaboration with a huge company. I'm going to go up. That huge company is probably going to see a decrease. That's just the way it goes. But, uh that's the way it happens with uh, will companies that people get out, they put a PR package together, whether it's true or not, or whatever the case may be. Maybe the company's so small that the bigger company's not even paying attention to them, and they say that stuff, and people will buy off of that. They will buy the information straight off of that. Okay. You know? So, you know, somebody could do the same thing with me. Somebody could be like, oh, look, man, I found this stock, Royal Financial Investment Group. So, cause I, and the reason why I say this is because even with my inbox, I get inboxes all the time with, hey, could you uh, – 
whether it's promoting an app, whether it's promoting a blog, whether it's promoting a, uh, even sometimes it may be even a stock. Talk about this one, write about this one, write about that one. And these are not regular Joe Blow people. These are the actual companies themselves. Hey, can you talk about this? Or, hey, can you talk about that? Or, whatever the case may be. So I know that people try to bring attention to their particular stock. But I would never sway any of my fans to say, hey, you know, you know, I have a Series 65 license. I can't go out there and not disclose, hey, you know, I have an invested interest in this particular company. Or I have an invested interest, you know, we have a back dealing or whatever the case may be. That's why I tell people always do your own own research. Don't be like, hey, Prince said buy it, so I saw an investor channel. It got to be good. You know, it's like, hey, you know, if I may bring, I may do a review of it. Well, I look at this company. I don't know. Let's look at the hard facts. I may look at the hard facts with you with a video, and we can go from there. Cool. So. Well, I want to thank you for imparting your knowledge on us today. Um, hopefully, we can get back together and do this again soon. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and, and, you know, we, we'll see what will happen in the next few weeks when the 27th of September comes up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's, it's approaching fast. Yeah, the thing about it is, you know, I in situations like that, I never lay one way. Um, I always, uh, you, you may want to, uh, you can look at a, a volatility play mm -hmm. or you can look at a uh, movement play. You can play the movement or you can play the volatility more than plan a direction, you know, so I will keep that in mind. So we, we've seen it happen all the time. We've seen stocks that come out with amazing earnings, did awesome, stock trades down. We've seen companies that had Horrible earnings and the stock trade up. So it it depends. You know, I, I would play, you know, I would play the smart investor side of the house to where I would, uh, you know, I would play, if you know, if you, I've been on the conservative side of the house and play the volatility or the movement of the market, you know. Yeah, I think I'm going to play movement down. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see. You know, like, like you said, the ball is like a ball, it goes up in the air reaches the peak, and then it's got to come down at some point. Is it so, like, all, all it takes is Trump to say something crazy, and it'll go down. <laughs> oh, that might be in about the next 15, 20 minutes, the way, the way <laughs> <he's>... <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But, Prince, I want to thank you again, man. I'll let you get back to your day, because I know we're in totally different time zones. Oh, yeah, I appreciate definitely. you getting up early for us and uh -huh. joining us here today. Go get yourself some breakfast. And folks, remember the Black Health and Wealth Show is here to educate, inspire, and uplift. Peace and love, people. <laughs>